Today I have the pleasure of discussing an interesting and important topic, uh, distal radius fracture fixation. I'll be joined by three of our hand surgery faculty, uh, Dr. Douglas Hanel, who is both the program and fellowship director here at the University of Washington, um, and professor in hand surgery, uh, Dr. Jerry Huang, who is an associate professor in hand surgery and the head of the University of Washington's hand program, and Dr. Jeffrey Friedrich, who's associate professor uh, in the combined hand surgery program between orthopedics and plastic surgery. So I'd like to begin our discussion by providing an overview of the epidemiology, history, and treatment of distal radius fractures. I began by stating that this is an important area of discussion. Why is that? Well, simply stated, distal radius fractures are, are a common injury in our patient population, especially in the elderly. Um, over 20% of fractures, uh, they represent over 20% of fractures among Medicare enrollees. They're second only to hip fractures in uh, uh, injuries among the elderly population. And after the age of 50, there's a 15% incidence of these injuries in women and 2% in men. So here you can see a commonly uh, cited quote by Irish surgeon uh, Abraham Collis, who's known as one of the uh, pioneers in distal radius fracture care. As Dr. Hanna likes to say, he was an optimist. Of course, he was at a distinct disadvantage as he preceded Redkin and the uh, advent of uh, x-rays by over 80 years. Descriptions of uh, these injuries have been around since the time of Hippocrates. Up until the 18th century, they are considered to be a dislocation of the wrist. Uh, French surgeons Goyron and Dupatron uh, provide a complete description of all eponyms. That is, they describe all fracture types and injury mechanisms that we see today uh, as early as 1832. However, because there's no communication between American and European surgeons at that time, no description uh, appeared in the American literature until much later. Of course, with advanced imaging and subsequent treatment and follow-up of these patients, it was eventually proven that Dr. Collis was wrong. And as you can see here, there are three landmark articles that this demonstrated. Uh, first, an inadequately reduced or stabilized fracture can lead to poor, a poor outcome, especially in young patients. Uh, that there's a difference in expected outcome for an intraarticular versus an extraarticular fracture. And that articular step off, uh, especially with poor reduction of that, can lead to poor results. So as time went on, we started developing uh, ways of treating these injuries. Initially in the 1980s and 1990s, our options were limited to percutaneous uh, fixation with uh, pins or to external fixation. This evolved in the early 1990s with the use of dorsal plating. Concern for risk of extensor tendon ruptures uh, with dorsal plating led to the uh, transition in, to a volar approach and plate fixation in 2001. The success of volar plating techniques with initial studies that reported no complications and its propo proponents advocating its use with all fracture types uh, led to a literal explosion in its use over the past 10 years. You can see here, this is a Google search uh, with the terms distal radius volar plates. They returned over 2,500 results in a half a second. So, despite the different treatment options for these injuries, the literature over the past 30 years has revealed that certain radiographic parameters are required for a good outcome. These parameters simply are radial inclination of at least five degrees, palmar tilt of at least neutral, radial length of ulnar neutral, that is to say within two millimeters of the articular surface of the ulna, uh, with no significant articular step-offs or gaps of uh, two millimeters in size, with a stable distal radial ulnar joint, and with no normal radial carpal alignment. So, we found that if these, if these parameters are met, the outcome of the fracture will be dictated by soft tissue injury and re rehabilitation, not by skeletal pathology. The goals of treatment can be de defined really from two perspectives. From a rehabilitation standpoint, the goals are complete digital range of motion, normal sensation, a pain-free wrist range of motion, and the absence of dystrophy. Perhaps more importantly for our patients, uh, the goals are uh, a return to a previous level of function, including all their activities of daily living, return to their previous occupation, and their hobbies and interests. So given the myriad of options without a preponderance of evidence in the literature supporting one particular method, treatment of these fractures can, can uh, appear daunting and sometimes confusing. In an effort to provide guidelines to the application of these techniques, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery formed a task force. They revealed the scientific merit and efficacy of these advances and produced in December of 2009 a guideline including 29 recommendations for treatment of distal raised fractures. 
In the remainder of today's grand rounds, we'd like to present how we use these guidelines in our practice daily at the University of Washington. So to discuss uh, indications for closed versus open treatment, I'd like to introduce Dr. Friedrich and invite him to come to the podium. Thanks, Matt, and uh, good morning. Thanks for having me here. Um, so as uh, Matt said, I'd like to talk about, first of all, the role of conservative treatment or, or uh, closed treatment for distal radius fractures, and then what um, are the, what we would say are the uh, common indications for surgery for these, uh, for these problems. So uh, I'll first attempt to answer the larger question, is there a role for non-operative treatment for distal radius fractures? And I would say I'd maintain that the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, so this is an example of a, uh, a middle-aged woman that had sustained a ground-level fall, and it's uh, a bit difficult to see here, but there's a metaphyseal uh, fracture of the left distal radius. It's essentially non-displaced or minimally displaced. This is uh, week two. Uh, you can, it becomes less visible on the AP, but more on the lateral here. You can see a little bit of a cortical disruption. And then here's week three, x-rays in the cast. Uh, alignment has been maintained, and, uh, and this is a good, thus far, a good treatment outcome. So, and I would maintain that uh, a fracture like this that is non or minimally displaced and is extra articular, uh, it, it would be difficult to justify any other type of treatment for that. So uh, that's, in some ways, th those are the easy ones, in some ways. So I'm going to start with the... Uh, uh, talking about the AAOS recommendations that pertain first to non-operative treatment, and that the first one is recommendation number two uh, from their guideline. And so they state that they are unable to recommend for or against casting for unstable fractures that are initial, initially adequately reduced, so people that have an unstable fracture but get a good reduction. And their, the strength of this recommendation or the strength of the literature on which they based this recommendation, they said was inconclusive meaning there were essentially no studies that, uh, that met inclusion criteria. And so that leads us to the question of what is unstable? And I think a lot of people would say, well, it's, it's a bit uh, like uh, how obscenity is defined. You know, I can't say what it is, but I know it when I see it. Um, and so, uh, as I said, no literature met criteria for this, these particular guidelines. One of the um, tried and true papers of distal radius management is by LaFontaine, which was uh, put out nearly three decades ago. It's a very short three-page paper. And there were four uh, criteria that they used to define unstable fractures and fractures that would have a high chance of failure uh, with closed management. And those were dorsal comminution, a fracture of the ulnar styloid, uh, angulation dorsally more than 20 degrees, and an intraarticular fracture. And then this group later added age greater than 65 uh, as a risk of failure of closed treatment. Uh, and this fracture here you see on the right would certainly qualify for that. There's uh, dorsal angulation more than 20 degrees. And you can also see a fair amount of dorsal comminution there. So uh, going back to their recommendation, um, I, I think to take away from the AAOS recommendation on this is is it possible to treat these with cast management, these unstable distal radius fractures? The answer is yes, but it's a bit of uh, buyer beware. This is something that uh, will have to be seen weekly, and, and uh, these unstable fractures uh, potentially are at a higher risk for, as I said, failure of that closed management and may need later uh, operative treatment. So moving on to the next recommendation regarding non-operative treatment, they suggest rigid immobilization, meaning cast, uh, when uh, using non-operative treatment for displaced distal radius fractures. And the strength of that recommendation was moderate, or the strength of the literature based on, the, on which they based that recommendation. So there were five level two studies. There was more pain with less rig rigid immobilization, meaning splints or, or non-cast type immobilization, and more radial nerve problems with the, that less rigid immobilization. And in our experience, or at least in my experience, initially at the sound of uh, being told that uh, a cast is recommended, many patients will balk, but, uh, but they do work. And, and so uh, they are suggesting rigid or cast immobilization for these displaced fractures. Now, uh, the, the next question is, well, do you have to do the same thing for non-displaced or minimally displaced fractures? And they state that the use of removable splints is an option. Uh, again, this is fairly non-committal, I think, on their parts. The strength of that uh, evidence was pretty weak. Um, uh, 
They did find that the evidence was mixed, especially in terms of pain with uh, cast versus uh, splint immobilization. Um, and this is that patient that I showed at the outset of the uh, presentation. This was a minimally displaced fracture. Uh, we went ahead with the cast treatment because, uh, as I said, patients often don't like casts and will uh, sometimes negotiate for a splint. But the casts work because it's a, uh, it's for the most part a built-in degree of compliance, although as you all know, uh, sometimes people will find ways around that as well. So recommendation number nine is, uh, and continue, continue with the closed treatment, uh, was about elbow immobilization for closed treatment of distal radius fractures. And they say they're unable to recommend against, for or against immobilization of the elbow, and that was inconclusive, they found. They, they are specifically looking at uh, prevention of pronation and supination, which um, that, that's not necessarily elbow immobilization, that's uh, forearm immobilization. So there was one level one study and they found that there was no difference between a sugar tong and a radial gutter splint. And so I, I, I think um, in our minds, unless there is a distal radial ulnar joint injury or a sigmoid notch injury, uh, there is uh, no indication for putting the cast above the elbow. And I would maintain that if you have a distal radial ulnar joint injury or a sigmoid notch injury, that is probably not something that would qualify for closed treatment. That's something that uh, needs to be thought about, uh, uh, operative management should be thought about for that particular case. Um, so recommendation number 15 is that uh, fractures that are treated non-operatively be followed by ongoing radiographic evaluation for three weeks and at cessation of immobilization. Th this is uh, sort of, uh, th this is intuitive, the weekly follow-up with closed treatment of any sort of uh, fracture. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that they came to a consensus on their recommendation, but the paradox is there was no evidence for that. They had no evidence for weekly follow-up of closed treatment of fractures, but the group felt that this was essential to uh, discover and prevent malunions or failure of uh, immobilization or closed treatment. Um, they, they did not look at cost of care, um, what it costs uh, for the patient to be coming in weekly, the patient burden. They simply were looking at uh, prevention and treatment of malunions. So now that we've talked about non-operative treatment and the people that qualify or don't qualify for that, uh, how do we determine who qualifies for surgery or uh, who should be treated with surgery um, for people that have uh, fractures at the outset that require surgery or who have failed conservative treatment? So recommendation number three from the AOS states that they suggest operative fixation for fractures with a post-reduction uh, criteria listed here, which is radial shortening more than three millimeters, a dorsal tilt more than 10 degrees, and a displacement or step off more than two millimeters. There's a couple of caveats, I think, with that. Uh, the first being this is a post-reduction <coughs> x-ray criteria, and as we all know that uh, certainly within, uh, uh, around here, people get a good reduction attempt. But in a lot of ways, I, I think the emergency department uh, reduction is, is somewhat of a dying art. And uh, so we are, we're certainly seeing these fractures that have gotten no attempted reduction, but thankfully those are, are not very common. The other caveat I'll point out is with the displacement or step off more than two millimeters. With a step off more than two millimeters, the intra observer reliability and judging that on plain x-rays is fairly good. Uh, becomes less good with a one millimeter step off. Uh, but I will um, uh, tell you that with displacement or gapping of the distal radius fracture, I think that's very difficult to tell with, a, with plain x-rays, AP and lateral x-rays. And I would maintain that uh, a gap, uh, trying to determine the size of a gap on a distal radius fracture is probably best determined with CT. I just don't think that uh, that can be discerned on, um, on plain x-rays with, with high reliability. And so the strength uh, of the literature on which they based this recommendation was moderate. Um, there were five randomized control trials. Four studies showed um, less complications in the operative group. Now the complications were not the same study to study. So this was essentially not, this was not a meta-analysis. This was a systematic review. And their strength rating, the moderate strength rating, as I said, came from the differences in complications between the non-operative and the operative group with these type of, uh, these type of values. And so you see on this uh, x-ray on the right, this gentleman would certainly qualify for uh, 
operative treatment based on those criteria that they set forth. This is obviously post-reduction, as you can see the cast there. The uh, shortening of the radius, certainly in the ulnar column, is significant, and there's a significant amount of comminution. So recommendation number five and six in the AAOS uh, guidelines concerns patients greater than 55. Um, I, I guess um, they, they're looking at quote unquote elderly patients, although I maintain that 55 is certainly not elderly. The reason why they settled on the age 55 is because uh, the studies for this are scattered. Uh, there's not many of them and they use different ages. Some use 55 and some use 60. And the AAOS uh, somewhat arbitrarily settled on 55. Uh, they found that uh, they are unable to recommend for or against operative treatment for people older than 55, and the strength of that was inconclusive. So there were mixed studies, and they were mainly looking at external fixation versus cast and pins versus cast, and that, this is a bit of a straw man argument because some of these predate uh, the, the, the volar plating uh, era, but there was no real difference in complications ultimately in patients uh, over 55. So. Uh, I think, I think most of us would say that um, changing the treatment plan solely based on the patient's age is, is injudicious and, and uh, not wise. And certainly you want to take into account the patient's other morbidities and lifestyle. Uh, but I, I know 55-year-olds that, uh, that could take me in a good fight. So uh, that determining whether or not somebody gets operative treatment just based on their age, I, I, say, I would say is not recommended. <laughs> Uh, the segue to that is an, uh, recommendation six, which they are unable to recommend for or against locking plates, the volar locking plates, in patients over age 55. This was also inconclusive. It was based on one level two study of plate, uh, volar plate versus pins, and there was no difference in outcomes, specifically with uh, complications uh, and other functional outcomes. We do know that obviously locking fixation in the wrist and in other places is, is certainly warranted, and uh, an osteoporotic bone when you have bad bone or an unfavorable construct. And, and certainly it has a role for that, but uh, solely determining uh, to use locking plate fixation based only on the age, I, I think is uh, doing a disservice for the patient and the, uh, the larger uh, lifestyle and, and uh, medical needs should be taken in, into consideration. And then this one, this last recommendation that I'll talk about is, is somewhat of an outlier, but I, I think it segues with those uh, recommendations five and six. And this is recommendation number 17. They're unable to recommend for or against using the occurrence of a distal radius fracture to predict future fra fragility fractures. And that was also inconclusive. They looked at five studies. Four demonstrated a very small, and in their words, uh, and rarely important increase in probability of future fragility fractures. And so, uh, say you have a middle-aged woman with a ground-level fall that sustains a distal radius fracture. Uh, I think that um, obtaining other diagnostic studies, such as bone density scans and the like, uh, probably is not a, a, a good use of uh, healthcare dollars uh, solely based on that distal radius fracture. Um, and I believe that's all I have. Thank you very much. My partner, uh, Dr. Doug Hanel, who will now talk about uh, operative treatment of these distal radius fractures. So thank you. Um, how do we fix these things? So if you look at the, uh, the, the recommendations, the recommendations are inconclusive. There is no particular method that is advised by the academy. Uh, and why is that? Well, I think it, it has to do with studies such as this. This is a study from our institution that was spearheaded by Julie Agel and, and Hans Kreter, um, looking at a double-blind randomized study. And at the time, it was one of the two double-blind randomized studies from multi-centers that were in the orthopedic literature. And the conclusion of this was that if you take all comers and you say at the end of treatment, we want to have what we, are, what we describe as acceptable skeletal criteria, then what's the outcome going to be? And we found that with external fixtures and pins, at six weeks, the outcome was better. Patients did better, but when you compared it at a year, which has then subsequently been substantiated in the next 20 years of, of reviews, um, it's the same, as long as you met the radiographic criteria that Matt uh, Lyons referred to earlier in the discussion. And the importance of this is that there's really two conclusions. 
all things being equal in orthopedics, that which gets the least dissection and the be will get you the best results. And then the mantra of this orthopedic program is this, the surgeon is the operation. And so how well you perform or use a tool is the operation as defined by us. The archer is the arrow, and if that's true, then here's our quiver. And there is indications for all of these techniques, pins, external fixtures, and including screws and plates, and then there's a role for bone grafting in some of these fractures also. So how do you figure out what you're going to do? And it's our basic approach is to find the personality of the fracture. Is it extra-articular? Is it intra-articular? Is it stable? And to that end, can it be treated closed? And if it can be treated closed, we do and follow the guidelines that we just heard from Dr. Friedrich. If it can't be treated closed, what needs to be fixed? So what are you going to do with that? There's a number of classification systems, none of which really work well. There is one approach to these that's a combination of something that was proposed by Robert Medoff called fragment-specific fixation and by two Swiss authors, Rickley and Regazzoni, who looked at and divided fractures into a lateral column, which consists of the scaphoid fossa, radial styloid, and lateral radius, an intermediate column, the lunate facet, sigmoid notch, and the medial radial metaphysis, a medial column, which was the ulna and the triangular fibrocartilage complex, which gave stability to the distal radio ulnar joint, and it sits on a pedestal the metaphysis. Robert Medoff divided these into the most common fractures based on all of his intraarticular fractures that he and a number of uh, hand surgeons who contributed CT scans to his study, uh, dividing into various parts. And he said, we can, we can break these fractures up into these component parts, and we can deal with them as component parts. Well, it's pretty tough to figure out what parts are involved in here other than everything. So how does, and how do you use that to direct your treatment? Well, the easiest way that I do, and that we do, and we recommend here, is to do a closed reduction. And this is a closed reduction maneuver that is described by John Agee. And it consists of longitudinal traction, palmar translation of the hand relative to the forearm, slight pronation of the hand relative to the forearm, not relative to the elbow. And with that, you can take and look for very specifically for fractures that involve the volar ulnar corner as shown in that arrow. And that is the cornerstone of the distal radius. Now the importance of this reduction maneuver I think is lost in our literature except in articles that are written from this institution. And so for those of you that will review this in, in later times, um, here's the two references that are hidden in our, in our literature. And so those are two references that I would recommend anybody who is going to deal with distal radius fractures, that they read that just for the reduction maneuver, not for the treatment, but for the reduction maneuver. What's the role of CT scans that was mentioned? And CT scans have been shown to improve intra-observer reliability. They direct the treatment plan when compared to plain radiographs, and they identify pathology, especially in the sigmoid notch. And if you look at these articles, these are all from about a decade ago. And what has happened in our institution is that in the from about 1995 to about 2000, every patient got a CT scan with a distal radius fracture. Now we do this infrequently. We infrequently get CT scans. And why do you do that? Well, I think we do that because of our reduction maneuvers and our closed reduction maneuvers. There was an argument that we could identify all of this intraoperatively by using um, arthroscopy. And if you look at arthroscopy, you would think that you would have improvement in all aspects of your diagnosis. But if we go to the literature and to the academy recommendations, does it, is there proof that it improves our diagnostic accuracy? And there's only weak evidence in our literature. Does it? improve our evaluation of step-offs, gaps, and the significance of those step-offs and gaps compared to what we were able to identify from plain radiographs after closed reduction. And again, the evidence is weak. And uh, does it help us treat um, associated ligamentous injuries? And again, the strength of that in our literature is weak. So how do you use this and what do you do with that? So, so how do I fix these? Well, the first thing that I do is I do that closed reduction. 
And I'm specifically looking at, and most importantly, I look at after that closed reduction, whether or not I have volar cortex continuity, whether or not I have the volar medial corner intact. And if I have that, this is a fracture that's amenable to very simple fixation. And that very simple fixation is this, two pins. They're ortho they are orthogonally placed in their distal fixation, and they will control that fracture in that setting. And so there still is a role for pin fixation. Now, if I have a fracture like this, and I look at that volar corner, that volar ulnar corner, this is an unstable fracture with an unstable corner. And it is absolutely essential that we control that medial, volar medial corner. And if you don't, what will end up happening is that the radius relative to the carpus, or the carpus relative to the radius, will sublux or dislocate volarly. And although it is popularized that you can fix this with volar plating, you actually have to fix the fracture fragment. So if it's a smaller fracture fragment, such as this, putting on a very popular volar plate isn't going to do anything for you or for that patient. And it requires that we return this patient to the operating room, remove the fixation plate, perform intraarticular osteotomies, put it back in place, and the complexity of the implant can be really quite simple. And these are often referred to as paper clips or, or fragment-specific fixation in a device that is, is, was proposed by Robert Medoff and works specifically for these very, very small fractures in a, uh, in a well-directed way. And these are the outcomes of that. Volar plating uh, is almost a standard of care. The first go-to piece of armamentarium of most orthopedic surgeons or hand surgeons in the United States is a volar plate, as defined by um, review of cases done by board-eligible surgeons reviewing their cases for part two of the national boards, volar plate. And it was popularized by George Orbe and Diego Fernandez in 2002 presented in the literature. And of those cases that are presented, and of the first 64 cases that were presented, they argued that with a volar exposure, we had less tra trauma. It avoids tendon ruptures. It applies to over 90% of fractures, which remains true. It can be used in the elderly, and there was not one single complication. There wasn't a single complication in volar plating for five years, the first five years of that, so, which is truly remarkable. Because it, every other implant in orthopedic literature can be and invites complications. And as of now, every complication that could possibly happen with dorsal plating or any other fixation plating has been described in the orthopedic and hand literature, including loss of reduction, tendon ruptures, nerve irritation, and complex regional pain syndrome, reinforcing the fact that the surgeon is the operation. So there is a role for volar plating. A great majority of them do require volar plating and can be treated with volar plating. But there are certain cases where the amount of comminution actually invites and begs us to actually go dorsally and to address not only the central or intermediate column, but the lateral columns. And in that case, as in a case demonstrated here and reconstructed by uh, Sam Isan, our fellow, we need to direct it our attention to the dorsum and the comminution that is here. This actually represents an articular fragment. And if we had a CT scan of this, this fragment would be sitting down halfway down the metaphysis. And that, that gap that is there and the void that is there requires bone grafting and requires stabilization in order to reconstruct not only the volar rim, but the dorsal rim, as shown in black, but to use approximately 30 cc's of bone graft in order to support this construct. But if we look at the role of bone grafting in distal radius fractures, we'll find the following that uh, the Academy is unable to recommend for or against. And I think that, again, you don't need bone grafting in most cases, but you do need bone grafting in some cases. And this is an example of some of those cases. So is there a role for external fixture? The last of the things. In the past, the role of external fixation was in the presence of open fractures or indirect reductions or as a reduction assistant. 
looking at the academy recommendations and looking at the literature, there was a, a common thread in the literature that says if you can limit the time of external fixation, you will limit the amount of complications related to that. And there's actually no evidence. It may be intuitive that the sooner you get the fixture off, the less complications you have relative to pin track infections and that, but there's no evidence that, no sound evidence that that's indeed true. The other piece of information that uh, was proposed is that over-distraction of a fracture would lead to dystrophies. But if you read those articles very carefully, the position of most of those patients that received, that developed dystrophies and over-distraction were in a position that irritated the median nerve. And so it was median nerve irritation untreated will lead to dystrophy. And so their recommendations are inconclusive. In addition, they were unable to recommend this as a sole form of fixation in compression injuries. And th that's also intuitively true. An external fixer does one thing. It distracts a fracture. It provides longitudinal fixation, but it does not and cannot manipulate an intraarticular fracture even with ligament ataxis. The one thing that we do know is that if we are going to use an external fixer, we'd like the construct to be as stiff as we possibly can. And Fred Behrens demonstrated that if you spread the pins out, you'll get a stiffer construct. And if you put the bar as close as you can to the fracture, you will get a stiff construct. And how do we use that in our practice? Well, we take the sublime to the ridiculous. And the ridiculous in our setting is we actually use this external fixture as an internal spanning fixture. So it's now an internal fixture um, in those settings where we would otherwise be using external fixtures in our practice. There's, two, there's a number of published series, uh, Dave Roosh and us, uh, representing the Duke uh, Wake Forest and University of Washington series, and then our um, use of this device here at the University of Washington. And in this device, we use it in multiply injured patients, burns, associated pelvic fractures, patients that are going to have prolonged ICU stays, so it takes, eliminates pin track care for nursing care, and people that need to use crutches or be weight bearing on their upper extremities in the presence of distal radius fractures. We use it in patients that have limited available OR time to bias time um, between the presence of their fractures and definitive fixation, and in fractures that are not amenable to small fragment fixation because of their level of comminution. We use a number of devices, none of which are particularly suited for this or directed at uh, this device that is readily available to every orthopedic surgeon. Pins, if they are used, are removed at six weeks, and the average time in our plates before plate removal is 16 weeks, uh, with uh, the typical result being um, as good as um, other fixation techniques, and the end result reflecting soft tissue injury more than skeletal injury. So having said that, we have one more column to deal with, and I'd like to introduce my partner, uh, Jerry Wong, who would deal with the medial column. Thank you, Dr. Hanno. Dr. Lyons, Dr. Friedrich, and Dr. Hanno went over the current treatment recommendations for distal radius fractures. But what I wanted to focus on for the next portion of the talk are some of the common associated injuries that you find with distal radius fractures. Up to 80% of patients with an intraarticular distal radius fracture may have an associated injury involving the ulnar styloid, the distal radial ulnar joint, and other intercarpal ligament injuries involving the TFCC, the scaphioluniate ligament. This is a 35-year-old recently seen in clinic with a comminuted intraarticular distal radius fracture that was treated with vular plate fixation. Some of the parameters that Dr. Friedrich and Dr. Hanel talked about, restoration of the overall alignment, and the joint surface has been accomplished. But if you notice here, the patient also has an ulnar styloid fracture. The question becomes, does that need to be addressed? Patients will often come in with ulnar side of wrist pain. And currently, based on the literature that we have, the recommendations of the AAOS is that there really is no difference in functional outcome in patients who do not have an ulnar styloid fracture compared to those with an ulnar styloid fracture that's non-displaced or displaced. So the size, the location, and the overall displacement of the ulnar styloid fracture actually does not affect outcome. Most patients with the ulnar styloid non-union are asymptomatic. What is important, however, to is make sure you do an adequate assessment of the distal radial ulnar joint. That is actually the most important factor as far as patient outcome. This patient here, the DRUJ, it's a very obvious dislocation that's dorsal. 
but oftentimes the DREJ instability or dislocation is not that obvious. These are three patients with a lateral radiograph of the um, wrist, and on quick inspection, it may appear that the patient on the left has a congruent DRUJ, patient in the middle has a dorsally dislocated DRUJ, and the patient on the right has a volarly displaced or volarly subluxed DRUJ. However, the only one that's a true lateral is the patient in the middle. In fact, the patient on the left actually has a dorsally unstable DRUJ, and the patient on the right um, does, in fact, have a volar unstable DRUJ. But the most important part of the assessment is to get a true lateral. So in order to define a true lateral, um, here is a schematic as well as a radiograph of the wrist demonstrating what a true lateral should look like. The pisiform, which is outlined on the radiograph here, the anterior portion or the, or the palmar border of the pisiform should lie within the middle dird of the scaphoid. In order to get a true lateral as well, the meta, their metacarpal, the capitate, and the distal radius should also be collinear to make sure that the patient has neutral of flexion extension. So question becomes, you have a true lateral, the volar distal radius, the distal radius has been fixated. How do you assess for DREJ instability? Following fixation of the distal radius intraoperatively, it's important to do a good examination to assess for DREJ instability. The common maneuver is to look for ballotment or DREJ or shucking of the DREJ. This is performed with the wrist in both pronation as well as supination. Another important maneuver is axial loading of the forearm in pronation and supination to look for subluxation of the distal ulna. In a DRUJ that's unstable in pronation but is stabilized in supination, the current recommendation is treatment of the patient in the arm cast in supination for four weeks. In supination, what it does is it tightens the volar radial ulnar ligament and reduces the DRUJ. In patients with an ulnar styloid fracture in a DRUJ that's unstable in both pronation and supination, if you have a large fragment, oftentimes this will be amenable to percutaneous fixation with either pins or screws. In patients with a fragment that's completely displaced with an unstable DRUJ, oftentimes tension band wiring or open reduction internal fixation is recommended. In cases of a very small fragment that's not amenable to direct fixation, current recommendations are either for pinning of the DRUJ or open repair of your triangular fibrocartilage complex. A common mistake when you have a patient coming into the ER into clinic with a bad distal radius fracture with severe combination is to really focus on the bony injury. <coughs> this is an elderly female with a common due to intraarticular fracture with significant shortening in articular step off. On closer inspection, you actually note a fair amount of winding of the scaphoid in the interval. So this is a patient with a distal radius fracture as well as scaphoid lunate dissociation. So it's very important to make sure that's included as part of your assessment. In a study by Geisler in 1986, where he performed wrist arthroscopy on every intraarticular distal radius fracture, he found that, in fact, 68% of patients have an associated intercarpal injury, including the TFCC complex, the scaphoid lunate interval up to 32% of patients, and the lunotricuitral joint. So the question becomes, with the high prevalence of an intercarpal injury, is there a role for wrist arthroscopy? As Dr. Handel discussed earlier, um, there currently is very weak evidence supporting wrist arthroscopy as far as de defining your interarticular fragments, as far as your reduction, and also there really is no supporting evidence supporting the treatment of intercarpal injuries with wrist arthroscopy as it relates to patient outcome. In fact, in a recent study, um, approximately three years ago out of Europe, shows that if you have a low-grade injury, at one year, the majority of patients are actually asymptomatic with minimal pain. If you have a high-grade injury defined as grade three or four, which will be evident on radiographs, patients do have a fairly high incidence of continued pain that um, persists despite adequate treatment of the distal radius. So I think the most important takeaway message is patients where the carpal alignment on initial assessment are known to be out of um, place, it's important to address the carp intercarpal injuries in patients where it's an occult ligamentous injury, perhaps the overall outcome is not really related um, to treatment of those injuries. As far as assessment of carpal alignment, the easiest way of doing this is to look at what we call Galudo's arcs, which is outlined by the three lines here, looking at both the, prox the distal row of the carpus, 
as well as the proximal row, both the proximal and distal portion, the shift form a smooth curve, um, which would indicate that patient has intact carpal alignment. The distance between the scaphoid and the lunate bone should be less than three millimeters. Any distance greater than that is indicative of a scaphoid lunate ligament injury. And on the lateral view, talked about earlier, the their metacarpal, the capitate, the lunate, and the distal radius should be collinear. What's acceptable, radial lunate alignment less than 15 degrees, capital lunate less than 30 degrees, and escape lunate angle between 30 and 60. So currently, um, as far as intercarpal injuries, if you have DRUJ instability, which is really the key, if you have DRUJ instability, it's important to address both the ulnar styli as well as possibly a repair of an acute TFCC injury. As far as escape lunate injury, if you have a high grade, a grade three or four, that's evident on radiographs with diastasis greater than three to four millimeters or a dorsal intercalated instability, I think it's important to address those injuries. So after you've treated the radius fracture, you've also treated your associated soft tissue injuries, the important part is what do you do with the patient afterwards? Obviously your treatment option, your post-operative rehab and recovery is really dictated by the patient population and the type of patient you have. We have our own very very own Dr. Hanel here, who was obviously going to be very compliant, follow all directions, but we also know that's not really true. Surgeons are probably some of the worst uh, patients out there as far as uh, compliance and uh, following directions. But I think current recommendations for uh, post-operative mobilization, patients treated with close reduction pinning, typically pins are out and cast removal at six weeks via die punch, intraarticular fracture, six weeks in a cast, volar plating, two weeks in a cast, followed by early mobilization with a brace versus six weeks in a cast, really depending on the patient population and um, compliance and adherence to a strict uh, non-weight bearing, a accommodated fracture, again, six weeks in a cast. So again, based on the AOS guidelines, based on the current literature, there really is no evidence indicating an advantage to early mobilization with fractures involving the elbow and knee injuries, oftentimes early mobilization does give you an advantage and there's a better outcome, better range of motion. In this prospective randomized study out of Boston, they show that two weeks of casting with early mobilization versus six weeks at three months, the two patient populations actually have the exact same range of motion, same flexion extension, same forearm pronation, supination, and the same grip strength. Do all patients have to go through formal therapy? Patients who have absolutely no therapy meaning no formal therapy and no supervised therapy program, typically have more pain and worse functional outcome than those receiving at least therapist advice in a home program. But as far as specific formal supervised therapy, current recommendations of the AALS have demonstrated really no advantage of formal therapy over doing a good home exercise program. What is important, however, in the post-operative period is really focusing on making sure that patients work on shoulder range of motion forearm pronation supination, what's oftentimes neglected is really working on their finger range of motion. Oftentimes patients are afraid and a little bit apprehensive about using, moving their fingers right away, but that's probably the most important part of the early rehab, edema control and also wrist range of motion. The finger range of motion really starts in a very early period. When I see a patient in clinic in a preoperative visit, you actually want to go over with them on moving the finger even prior to surgery. And some of the uh, common exercises, what's known as the six pack, which focus on finger flexion extension, as well as abduction, adduction, and, and thumb opposition. And even the recovery room, as patients are waking up from anesthesia, it's important to really stress in the next couple weeks prior to the first post-operative visit to really focus on their finger range of motion. As you're seeing a patient back in clinic on the road to recovery, it's also important to stress to the patient that even at three months, continued improvement can be expected. Most patients between three months and six months do have a noticeable improvement in their wrist range of motion, an increase of 20 degrees of flexion extension arc, a 10 degree improvement in their forearm rotation, a five kilogram improvement in their grip strength, and a 10 point improvement in their overall subjective outcome score. Thank you. So I'd like to invite all members of the panel to come forward, and I think we first start by uh, answering any questions that people in the audience may have. One question, are we overall, if you compare the 70s and 80s to now the 90s and the new century, or operating far more distal radius fractures than in the past, uh, or is there a general trend uh, towards uh, operating less? What would you say? Well, having lived, I guess, having lived all those, those, those decades, the answer is 
is the indication for operative fixation. Open reduction internal fixation distal radius fractures has skyrocketed. And it is, um, it has created a huge industry. Now, whether or not the indications are exactly right that every patient that is treated with plates and screws necessarily needs to be plated, uh, played, be treated with plates and screws is, is arguable. And I think that we're going to see we're at the peak. I think that we're going to see it slide down. We're going to find patients that can be treated with less invasive methods. And we'll define who those patients are. And that's presently where we are, I think that we're at sort of underscore the excellent message that you all have put forth. I have recently had the opportunity of reviewing 100 closed malpractice claims in the upper extremity. And among those, the, the th three themes that kept on emerging was one, people that were managing uh, displaced distal radial fractures in plaster had a big problem monitoring the position of the fracture. And over time, the notes would say, it doesn't look like it slipped much, it doesn't look like it slipped much, it doesn't look like it slipped much, and then finally it was obvious that it had slipped a lot. The second thing was missing the intraarticular component of the fracture, and the third was median nerve or uh, chronic regional pain syndrome issues that arose after management of these fractures. So I think this is a very timely symposium, and I think you all have addressed those uh, three factors, and hopefully with the knowledge that you're sharing the rate of those uh, claims being filed will be lessened. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, the, the biggest comment, and the, if the, the take-home message is, is that you're, if you're going to treat somebody closed, you're obligated to see them on a weekly basis and get x-rays. And you, your x-ray is that you get is compared to your best reduction film, not from this week to next week to next week. Week two needs to be compared to week zero. Week three needs to be compared to week zero, not one compared to two, two compared to three, because you get into that, that, that point of it's, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and now it's not okay. And in the, the great majority of those cases, at week, the week two x-ray, it's displaced. It's displaced significantly compared to what it was at week zero, and that's an indication for operative intervention. Or, in some cases, attempted re-reduction um, can be successful. Um, we choose not to, and I think one of the things that we choose not to, and it goes back to the issue of patient expectation, is one is we know that if we are able to reconstruct the skeleton and we're able to make it a stable construct, then the whole rehabilitation is directed at treating the soft tissues. And the outcome of any distal radius fracture is really, if you look at it at a year, a year and a half, it is not so much the motion, it's not so much joint pain as it is the residual pain of joint stiffness and of neurologic deficits if they are associated with that. And so I think that, again, I think it allows us to not have to worry about the skeleton by operating on these people and in, the, in that setting. So, any other comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll address the... Uh intraarticular component that you mentioned, sometimes missing that. And, and that's admittedly difficult sometimes on, on the plain x-rays, especially in plaster, uh, after it's been reduced and you're looking at uh, uh, basically a fuzzy image of the intraarticular surface. Sometimes the actual fracture itself can't be seen and you have to rely on indirect indicators for uh, intraarticular displacement, say displacement of the volar ulnar corner or the dorsal ulnar corner. And um, as Dr. Hanel alluded to earlier, I, I, you know, it's possible we should be getting more CTs on these, uh, these patients in order to, to truly tell. I, and I, I've uh, basically gotten to the point where if I can't answer all the questions uh, like, is this displaced um, you know, X number of degrees or does this have an intraarticular component, if I answer I don't know to any of those based on the x-rays, then I, then, I then I like to get a CT scan. And I, I, probably should be getting more of those. Um, and, and so that would certainly, it, it's, it's more resources, more healthcare resources, but uh, it may end up being a, a less overall cost in the end uh, to get that CT scan to truly tell the, as Dr. Handel says, the personality of the fracture. Comments? Um, I think the um, concept of a good close reduction and immobilization and plaster has almost become a lost art. I think over here at university, I think we're very fortunate to have residents who are very good at what they do. So oftentimes they fracture that maybe amenable to non fixation. 
if you do that good initial reduction and a good mold and a plaster or a cast, patients do quite well. And I think Dr. Matt's really hit on the point is to really follow patients closely. If there are any, any question about the personality or the characteristics of the fracture, I think it uh, may be an indication for a CT scan to better characterize it. But I think just really making sure you understand the fracture and um, making sure you maintain some of the reduction of parameters is really key to patient outcome. I had a question of the panel. The medial, uh, the uh, volar approach has some risk to uh, median nerve uh, irritation, or carpal tunnel syndrome. What is the risk that you might explain to the patient and uh, how does it usually resolve? There's, there's actually three scenarios um, that, that occur relative to distal radius uh, and relative to the median nerve. Scenario number one is the patient comes into the emergency room and has their median nerve out, just out, at the impact of injury. You have the patient who comes to the emergency room with a displaced distal radius fracture, has it reduced. It's in the days or hours that uh, evolve from the time of reduction to the time of going to the operating room, they develop median nerve symptoms. And the third scenario is the patient who is operated upon, who at the end of the operation wakes up in their hand, has numbness and tingling um, related to manipulation of the fracture in the volar plate. So those are three different settings, all of which um, demand an approach. And so I, I'll, let, I'll ask Matt. So Matt, patient comes in with the contusion. Right, and so the nerve's out straight away. Is that an emergency? Do we need to redo the, an emergency carpal tunnel release on that patient? My answer to that would be no, um, because you don't know uh, exactly when that nerve went out. It's very likely that it could be a contusion to the nerve from the injury mechanism itself. I'd say that's a different scenario than a patient with an evolving carpal tunnel syndrome, especially after reduction or as you watch them throughout the night. Yeah, so we'll throw that to Jim. What do you do with the patient who... <clears throat> Came in tonight, had a reduction, it's on your OR schedule maybe two, three days from now because that's when you can get them on your OR schedule, but starts to evolve a carpal tunnel symptoms. What, how do you approach that patient? I, I think that's something that needs to be done uh, tonight uh, because that is a, uh, a, that's a changing uh, exam. As you, to use the word personality, the personality is changing. Uh, the personality is getting a little saltier, so it, uh, I think that is something that needs to be addressed that night because it not likely is not due to the initial impact um, of the distal radius fracture and on the median nerve. It, it's uh, likely due to swelling, um, manipulation with the reduction. Um, uh, so that, I, that's something that I would uh, drag myself out of bed to do. Okay. So, so and Jerry, in, in your practice, um, what do you tell your patients about their median nerve symptoms related to your reduction? Um, sometimes I do tell the patient that as with any surgery, anytime you're working around a nerve or with man manipulation, there can be some swelling and neuropraxia or the nerve being um, temporarily asleep after surgery. So to have some numbness initially right after surgery is expected. But what we do worry about is that evolving carpal tunnel or the symptoms that worsen with time. So patients who go home who are feeling pretty good with uh, pain that's well controlled for the next two, three, four days, the pain increases, or they start getting hyperesthesia or increasing pain in their fingertips, or numbness that worsens, those are the patients that you worry about in the evolving carpal tunnel, like Jeff was saying. Um, that could either be from the reduction, or um, you worry about hematoma, or just overall swelling over time. I think it's really, you're looking at two separate groups in terms of really the timing of the median nerve symptoms. Actually, if I could ask a question related to that, and I'll throw it to you, Dr. Hanel, is, should, uh, let me take the devil's advocate uh, point of view and say, with every volar plate that we're putting on, why should we not be releasing every carpal tunnel? The, the one is the mechan it's not necessary. Uh, the incision that you're using actually does do a partial carpal tunnel release by uh, using a volar approach. And, the, um, and, and in doing that, it actually does decompress the carpal tunnel. If I have a patient, and I open in, a, in our last minute that we have, I'll close by saying the following. Is one is that if you have a patient who has evolving carpal tunnel symptoms, then a formal carpal tunnel release is, is necessary. Um, you know, whether or not it's 
at post-op day three or hour one post-reduction, a carpal tunnel release is necessary. Because that's the group of people that go on, the untreated group of people, those are the people that are most prone to reflex sympathetic dystrophies or complex regional pain syndromes. So when we have patients, the scenario the patient comes back, it just has exquisite pain out of proportion to what you normally do. Those patients, I look at them and go, we're going to do a carpal tunnel release. This is where my complex regional pain syndromes come from. And you treat that very, very aggressively. Having said that, the patient with the neuropraxia from the direct blow, or the patient who has the carpal tunnel release, or the patient who has numbness tingling, but not a whole lot of pain after manipulation of the nerve. If we look at those people at a year and a year and a half out, their neurologic function is normal in 99% of patients in the literature. But it's at one year that it becomes that way. And then finally, in the final closing comment of all your patients, the things that you can tell them is that they will continue to recover from their distal radius fracture, and they will feel like they actually have their wrist back somewhere around eight to 10 months after injury, not after their fracture heals, which happens at six to eight weeks, but it takes them somewhere between eight and 16 months after injury to really say that I have my wrist back and they will continue to improve. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.